Okay. So it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Elton Gennard. Um, he's an associate professor from the Micron School of Materials Science and Engineering at Boise State. Uh, Dr. Gennard received his Bachelor's of Science in Physics from Centenary College of Louisiana in 1996 and PhD from Purdue University in 2000. His dissertation research focused on the electrical conductance of multi-walled carbon nanotubes. His first postdoctoral position was in material science and engineering at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, where he studied surface structural evolution of halogenated silicon surfaces. He completed a second postdoctoral position in material science and engineering at Georgia Tech, where he constructed his first atomic layer deposition system and performed research on the fabrication of 2D and 3D photonic crystals using ALD. So he built that ALD system from scratch himself um, so they wouldn't have to travel to use one uh, off-site. After Georgia Tech, he held a teaching position in the physics department of Providence College and Rollins College before joining Boise State University's MSE department as a research professor in 2009. His research activities at Boise State include dynamic and structural areas of DNA nanotechnology, application of advanced scanning probe microscopy techniques, and development of ALD processes. He's currently an associate professor in the Micron School of Material Science and Engineering at Boise State. So um, Dr. Grenard also told me they just got a paper published in Nature Communications recently on his work in DNA nanotechnology. Um, he's also the recipient of the N an NSF Career Award. So we're really happy to have Dr. Grenard here with us today. Um, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Dr. Young, for that very kind and generous introduction. Uh, you made it sound very good, although you might think that's short attention span theater uh, at the same time. So uh, thank you for inviting me to give a seminar today. I'm super excited to be here and to talk about our work on atomic layer deposition. Um, I will say that uh, feel free to stop at any point if you, if you have a question about something and um, let me know. And maybe this could be uh, more of a conversation if there's something that strikes your, your interest. I'm happy to dig deeper into it. We could even talk about some of the DNA work. Um, but otherwise, I'll just talk about some of our uh, efforts in atomic layer deposition. And as the title says, I'm going to talk a little bit about in situ and ex situ characterization, as well as some computational efforts for understanding the fundamentals of the processes behind some ALD, um, understanding the fundamentals of some ALD processes for sodium fluoride. And if there's time, I'll talk a little bit about molybdenum sulfide as well. And that's some of the work that we've done with Matthias' uh, help when he was at Argonne. So the, um, let me start first by giving a little bit of, uh, of, of a plug for Idaho. Um, people have been moving to Boise and the, the Boise area in droves lately. So we've had a lot of growth. Uh, it's still a pretty amazing state. When my friend recruited me to Boise State back in 2009, 2008, we, we had no idea what Boise was or, or where it was and didn't know anything about it. Um, so just to make sure you, you have some context. So here's a, a map of, Bo of Idaho and Boise is under this red dot here. This is sort of what's called, um, the indigenous folks here called it the Peace Valley. This is shown in the Bannock. Um, you know, or, or thought of it as Peace Valley. This is where people would come. And in the 1800s, uh, folks started moving here uh, and haven't stopped. So it's a very beautiful area. This is the downtown of Boise and it's nestled against the foothills of the Rocky Mountains. So all of this is sort of mountain range through here. Um, and particularly, there's some, some really beautiful uh, mountains. The Sawtooth National Forest is kind of, this is the Sawtooths here. It's kind of like the Grand Tetons, but without any people there. So there's uh, lots of uh, outdoor activities, lots of great areas to explore. Um, and whoops. so this is, uh, I just took this photo here last weekend, um, about 20 miles from my house. So, um, lots of, of outdoor activities, lots of mountain biking, skiing. Uh, this bald eagle I took on my way to work uh, along the Boise River. 
So it's if you're into the outdoors and, and natural, you know, I think 60% of the state is federally protected land uh, of some sort. So lots to, to explore here. Um, Boise State uh, was Boise College until the 70s and became Boise State University. Uh, and in the 2000s started to transition into, uh, to, to build its research effort. And a lot of that has been driven by uh, Micron Technology, which is uh, one of the top 10 semiconducting companies in the world. It's a top three memory manufacturer. So they make NAND and DRAM memory. And they're about uh, seven miles from Boise State as their research and development headquarters. A billion dollar fab down the road and I've been able to take my class on tours and things like that. Um, but to provide uh, people for their workforce, they've heavily invested in engineering at Boise State University and sort of established the College of Engineering, the uh, Departments of Electrical and Computer Engineering, and then have been um, very um, generous in investing in material science research. And most recently, they donated some funding for our, a new building called the, the Micron Center for Materials Research, which is not just material science department, or which is now the Micron School of Material Science, but it's anyone doing materials research could have a home in, in this building, which has uh, got some large classrooms and office space in this region. And then this is actually a separate building uh, that's, that you can walk into, but it's um, the research wing where there's isolated slabs and um, you know all kinds of um, new, nice new labs. Uh, it was opened last summer, uh, so I actually have not even been in this building since uh, the pandemic, but uh, I'm, I'm told it's really pretty. Um, part of what drew me to Boise State was its uh, emphasis on undergraduate research, and I've been happy to be involved with that uh, and to, to help sustain that effort in my time there. Uh, when I started as research faculty, it was me working in the lab with about 20 undergraduates and two master's students. And in 2012, with a Micron donation, we started a PhD program. So that sort of shifted the, the nature of the workforce. Um, but we still have a lot of undergraduates that work with our, our graduate students. And so these two folks here are undergraduates that have uh, recently graduated in Olivia State of Boise State. I think Jesse went to to uh, UC Berkeley, and they're helping. These these students were the employees in this surface science lab where they operated this, uh, the Pacific Northwest's and even the world's only fast scan in a glove box, um, AFM. And they, they would operate that as a user facility for other people's research. Um, this is Carrie who's uh, training some students on a Lego AFM that we have. and. Uh, this is a laundry who was working in our clean room. So, um, and I think she's maybe at UC Berkeley now too. Um, so lots of, of still a big effort in undergraduate research as our research effort grows. So a little plug for Boise and Boise State. Um, before I get going on the research talk, I wanted to thank all the people involved, uh, including some faces you might recognize. Um, so, uh, we have a, a group at Boise State, and I've been fortunate enough to collaborate with Jeff Elam's group at uh, Argonne National Lab and uh, Beamline scientists there and other faculty at Boise State on this effort. And then I uh, want to thank all of them for their uh, for the, doing the work and what I'm going to talk about, particularly Steve Letourneau, Jake Soares, uh, and Sarah Caritas have been sort of the main students behind a lot of this work and Matt Lawson did the DFT work um, and then the funding agencies for their financial support of our research. So let me start by giving a brief overview of atomic layer deposition just to make sure that we're all on the same page. Uh, it's been around for a while. There's sort of um, people keep figuring out that it was maybe introduced before the 70s by other other researchers throughout the world and so when it actually started and who invented it uh, is maybe debatable, but um, it's certainly become very popular since the 70s um, when it was used 
for the fabrication of pinhole-free conformal phosphor materials for electroluminescent displays. Um, at the time, using chemical vapor deposition, it was hard to get the conformality required for those uh, systems to work and, and to reduce pinholes, which if you're trying to build an electroluminescent display and you have pinholes, that will short your device and it, and it won't operate. In chemical vapor deposition, sometimes the chemistry produces particles in the vapor phase. They deposit and, and can lead to pinholes. So uh, to solve that problem, Tuomo Sintola separated the precursors in time. And you have this schematic here where you have this uh, binary chemistry where you have a, a, an initial surface and you add your precursor A, you saturate all the surface sites, maybe produce some byproducts, then you add precursor B, and that reacts with precursor A to give you this, this film, AB chemistry film. Um, and this allows you to use A and B chemicals that are very reactive. Since they only meet each other on the surface, you're going to get a film on the surface, and you're never allowing A and B to meet in the gas phase where they might form some particle that's going to um, disrupt the conformality and the uniformity of your film. Uh, instead of sending in precursors then simultaneously, you're doing this cyclic process to grow a film up of a desired thickness. You're just repeating this. And that leads to the main con of atomic layer deposition, which is it's very slow. Uh, so that you know may be a problem. Um, as in the microelectronics industry, as films became thinner and thinner, the idea of using uh, ALD as a as a tool for for semiconductor fabrication grew because you you needed precision thickness, you weren't growing a very thick film, so you didn't have to worry so much about needing a lot of time to grow those films. Now ALD is is uh, um, a, in scalable high volume manufacturing. There's uh, from talking with folks at Micron, there's at least two ALD processes on each of their 12 inch uh, 300 millimeter wafers in production and that's at a rate of 640,000 wafers in production every month. So that's um, quite a lot of atomic layer deposition that goes into DRAM and NAND memory. And we'll see some examples of that. Um, so just to, to kind of go through the, the ALD steps in more detail, here's a, a, a cartoon process where we start with a, a surface and we have these green dots are sort of binding sites. All right, that's your, your beginning surface. And um, then you take that and you put it into a vacuum chamber. You pump the chamber down to about a tor uh, pressure, and then you send in your precursor. So this might be trimethyl aluminum. And it's finding and reacting with these binding sites. Not all sites can be found or accessed. So there may be some steric effects where a ligands block some site. Um, the main thing is to to react with every site that you can get to, right? So that you, you reach saturation of the sites. Um, you produce byproducts that then get purged, right? And then you send in your second precursor. Um, and now this will react with your first molecule and produce some other byproducts. And it might then re-expose these sites that were blocked the first time. So now your second pulse of trimethyl aluminum could access these. Uh, and so you end up with sort of sub monolayer growth on any particular ALD cycle. There are certain ALD processes where you get monolayer per cycle, but that's typically pretty rare. And you repeat this cycle over and over again, you know, and you're purging excess precursor and purging by byproducts between the introduction of each precursor. After you've done this a few times, you, you're starting to grow a film on itself. So one of the things that we're going to focus on here is there's a difference in your initial chemistry uh, versus what chemistry you might have later. Now, maybe your functional groups end up being the same as your initial functional groups, um, but typically you're starting with some chemistry and then evolving to a new chemistry, and that evolution doesn't necessarily happen immediately. And how that progresses can can be interesting and and challenging to understand. So uh, one thing to make sure that you've um, you 
you send in enough precursor to react with all of the available surface sites. So you, you can actually study that by monitoring, by growing films, right, doing several cycles, maybe 50 cycles of, of an ALD process where you vary the precursor pulse times and then you see how thick is the resulting film. And at some point, adding more precursor doesn't lead to an increase in the film thickness. That indicates that you're, you've sent in enough chemical to saturate the surface, and now that saturated chemical um, reaction is controlling your film thickness, not how much precursor you send in. So if you operate sort of at these regimes, you know you're sending in enough chemical to saturate the surface, so maybe you would do like a 1.5 second exposure for hydrogen sulfide and maybe um, uh, a 1, 1 1.25, 1.5 for molybdenum hexafluoride. And that, that w so you're not wasting a ton of precursor, but you're ensuring saturation each time. That's part of the uh, process forgiveness that comes with the, using atomic layer deposition. If you were doing chemical vapor deposition and you wanted very good thickness control, you have to control the precursor concentrations, the flow rates, the stoichiometry very, very precisely to get the right film composition. Here, you're sort of having to rely on the surface chemistry to control that for you, and you just um, can send in a little bit more than enough chemi chemical. So you don't have to con control things precisely, but you, because you're turning over that control to the surface chemistry. If you, if you're able to do that, um, then you can establish an atomic layer deposition window, right? So all of the surface chemistries are temperature sensitive, typically, and so you can, you know, there's lots of different chemistries. You you find a region where you have what's called a constant growth per cycle. And this is a, a cartoon, right? Nothing actually looks like this, but you can get approximation. So if you lower the temperature, you might not get the reactivity you need on the surface. Um, and maybe your, your uh, precursors are, are not sufficiently reactive with the surface. If you're using water and you lower the temperature, you may end up condensing too much water on the surface and having too much fizz absorption so that your purge process needs to either be very long or it's maybe not quite as effective. And that can increase your, your growth rate. Ah, sorry, my mouse is misbehaving. Um, so within the ALD window, right, you, you hope to have a constant growth per temperature. If you keep going in temperature increasing, you can your precursors could decompose. And so then you, you might lose that self-limiting behavior. So then if you send in a little bit extra molybdenum fluoride, you might get uh, a little bit thicker MOS2 film, um, which might not be what you want, or you might start to desorb species so that your film thickness reduces. The other thing that can happen within the growth temperature range is your film could change its phase. So if you had an amorphous film at lower temperatures that became crystal, and you might see this transition to a lower growth per cycle, and then maybe transition again at a next uh, another phase similar to for titanium dioxide where you're forming anatase and then possibly some rutile as well. So the, the temperature window is important. Within that window, you get this linear growth with the number of cycles or nominally lim linear. And that's uh, sort of what we're looking at here. You increase your number of cycles, you get a thicker film and for certain processes, this is a very, very straight line. And so then you, you can precisely control your film thickness just by changing the number of cycles with integer um, steps on growth per cycle. So typically, growth per cycle is the metric that gets used with the ALD rather than growth rate, because the time it takes to execute a cycle can vary depending on the morphology of the surface, whether you're growing in a high aspect ratio uh, vias or whether you're growing flat films on a planar surface. Um, those will affect the, the time necessary, but the, the thickness per cycle should stay the same. There's been lots of materials that have been grown with atomic layer deposition, and it's gotten to the point uh, where it's easier to see what hasn't been grown with atomic layer deposition. 
uh, in some form or another. So this periodic table shows that um, I've, I've blocked out uh, the, only the parts of the periodic table that haven't had a particular ALD process uh, for them. So you can see the, the materials under these blue squares are where there's lots of room for some interesting research activity to try to fill these in. So we can try to do ALD with the noble gases or something like that. Um, so th there's lots of ALD processes, uh, and this is the Atomic Limits database, which is continuously uh, updated. Um, so you can find your, your favorite process in here. So again, ALD, because it's controlled by self-limiting uh, saturating surface chemistry, it allows you to grow uh, conformal films over complicated geometries uh, that are pinhole free. If your surface, your initial surface chemistry is uniform, then you'll have a pinhole free film. If you have contamination or some change in your surface chemistry, that might not be coated by your incoming film. And that's a, an active area of research called area selective deposition, which is sort of um, intentionally defeating the pinhole free nature of ALD uh, for certain chemistries. But it's been used for lots of different applications. This is a cross section of some DRAM cells just um, showing the, the films that get deposited uniformly within these high aspect ratio vias uh, in memory cells. You know, and, and you can see um, you've got metals and dielectrics and other materials that get deposited in these, these structures where you, you really need for a, a well-defined capacitor to, to have these films be uniform within these structures. Um, and this is a bit dated, which is why I'm able to show it in the slide, but um, the aspect ratios now for, for DRAM memory cells are, are quite high. Um, here's some other examples just where you can transition chemistries to grow nanolaminates. If you mix in uh, chemicals, you can do doping as well. So you might do 99 cycles of one chemistry plus one cycle of a different chemistry. Uh, and then maybe you anneal it afterwards to, to dope materials. Um, this is a hafnium aluminum oxide composite. Uh, these are the zinc sulfide, manganese, and titania composite film in an inverse opal. So this sort of gives you some sense of, you know, these were uh, coatings that were deposited on silica beads that were touching, and you can see the contact points remain uh, in, the, in, in the film. Uh, but you can sort of see how the ALD is able to infiltrate and coat the surface of those spheres they, the actual surface of the sphere was here initially. Uh, after it was removed, this, this layer was then added on top of that. Whether the films are amorphous or uh, polycrystalline or you're trying to grow epitaxially all depends on the chemistries uh, involved. So zinc sulfide tends to be a polycrystalline film. A lot of the ionic materials are, are polycrystalline. Uh, more covalent materials like titania, you can grow amorphous films at room temperature. Uh, that are super smooth. So how do we do it? Um, the reactor that we use at Boise State now, it is uh, maybe the fifth, sixth version from the first one I built. Um, and it, we've you know, been working with other groups and have learned a lot of tricks of the trade and have, uh, imp implemented a few of our own tricks for this, this tool, but this is our main development reactor. So if we do something, uh, break something in here, we can take it apart and fix it and um, get it to work. But, uh, you know, we, I'll go a little bit through that, um, that the system that we've got. So this is uh, sort of how we enter our samples. So this is uh, Sarah and Tyler working on a reactor. And um, so we, we, have these sort of insertion tubes, so we load our samples at the end. Pretty, pretty high tech stuff here, and then we have this piece of silicon, and we stack our little coupons on top of that, and slide it into the reactor. This is when we have a quartz tube in the reactor. I think it's stainless steel currently, um, and you know, for other processes, maybe we'll switch to an alumina tube. Um, you know, and we sort of have that flexibility and the, uh, the samples sort of go inside of that port there that's closed at the moment. 
this is a schematic of the system. So this is sort of where all the precursors are housed in these manifolds here. Uh, they send in precursor into the tube furnace um, through these little quarter inch tubes and then we, we send in some carrier gas from behind there to, to keep dead space from forming. We try to make sure that we have a turbulent um, viscous flow regime inside of the reactor so that we don't end up forming lamella that carry our precursors you know, past the sample and, and never have much reaction. Um, we load our samples here plus some metrology tools and then we pump it out and through our abatement system. So how all that links to the um, to the main system. So we've got our precursor bay here. So we've sort of high vapor pressure precursors up here uh, that are liquids or maybe lower vapor pressure that we need to heat. And then some gases down here that are on these cross purge systems, uh, higher pressure gases like hydrogen sulfide. Uh, this is our tube furnace, right? Where we load our samples. It's a brand new tube so we can actually see through it. This thing gets coated and it becomes opaque. Um, was there a question? I don't believe so. Okay. Uh, and then this is where we load our, our samples and we can load in our metrology tools. So we'll talk about that in a second, or we can add a, an RGA. We have a, an RGA sitting on here, um, which is here. It's an XTOR system. So it's nice because you, it's all the parts are replaced, you know, user replaceable. In ALD, uh, all the parts are consumables. So you have to be sure that you can fix uh, the systems yourselves and not have like a very expensive RGA that you can uh, service. And then this is our multi-stage abatement process where we try to clean up all the, the precursor, uh, excess precursors and their byproducts. This is our control software. It's all controlled through LabVIEW. And we've uh, done quite a bit of work to try to make our lives a little bit easier down the road. So one of the things we do with uh, quartz crystal microbalances measure mass changes. And it's way easier to calculate the change in mass from one pulse to the next if you do it in real time than if you try to post-process it, um, the data. So we've you know, taken the lab view and, and added those, those features in to control the, the tool. And the students uh, do all this. So I mentioned quartz crystal microbalance. This is an example. So here's the, the sensor. So it's this gold um, coated quartz crystal, or maybe it's an alloy. Um, and you're measuring the change in the resonant frequency of this crystal as you deposit your films on it. So just like they've been used in, for physical vapor deposition to monitor film deposition for a long time. So here we're using it um, for uh, chemical reactions and you can see when you pulse in a precursor, say a molybdenum hexafluoride, you can see this big increase in the mass on the crystal and then after you wait, shut the pulse off, you might see this um, drop back down, right, and reach some steady state level. Then you send in your hydrogen sulfide and you may see next to zero mass change, right, so that's, that's kind of interesting and it varies as a function of temperature which is also interesting. If you just keep going, you'll eventually see this turn into a linear growth per cycle where you can calculate your deposition rate. To translate, this is really mass change, right? So if you knew your film density, you could then change that, translate that into thickness um, as a function of cycle. And you, you know, you usually want to confirm your thickness with some other um, uh, approach as well, either in situ or ex situ ellipsometry is used quite a quite a bit. Um, you can use the draft analyzer. So the one we have now is um, is sort of a different residual gas analyzer. This one is is too expensive, and um, when you start to coat the quadrupole, you you change the shape of the the peaks for the the elements, but um, so we try not to do too much ALD reactions inside of this RGA, uh, but you can measure the byproducts, uh, you can measure the, the precursors themselves and track those temporally to try to get an idea of the surface chemistries. So the, um, the other th tool that gets used quite a lot that we're working on implementing uh, at our lab 
we've collaborated with with Argonne National Lab to use their system is, is Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy, FDIR, where you can um, compute different spectra, where you sort of look at the, you take a scan of the surface, then you send in a pulse of water, and then take another scan of the surface and see, and subtract the two curves to see what changed. So you send in water and you can see um, peaks that are associated with hydroxyl groups. Um, you see an increase in intensity there, and you see a decrease in intensity where there's methyl groups uh, and CH stretches. And so you send in a pulse of trimethyl aluminum, and you see a loss of hydroxyls, an increase of methyls, an increase in CH, and you can see these bulk aluminum oxide, which tells you you're growing an aluminum oxide film. So you can gain a lot of insight into the process chemistry by these in situ characterization tools. Um, and you try to take all the information from these different tools, how much mass change you had uh, per half cycle, what the byproduct evolution is, uh, what's the surface chemistry look like with FTIR, and then take all that information and try to establish what are the chemical equations um, that are behind the film you're trying to grow. So you might have um, MOF6 plus H2S is trying to grow MOS2, and maybe we have some of these byproducts form. This is sort of, you know, one possible reaction. This might be for steady state um, overall reaction, but how that gets implemented in the two half cycles of ALD is sort of um, the main, one of the big areas of research in developing an ALD process. So here if I have some thiol group on a surface and I add MOF6, then I might write down some equations um, for that process and then take this as my now is on my surface uh, and that becomes the part of the equation for my second half reaction when I'm sending in hydrogen sulfide. Um, and I can try to then solve for this X by looking at all of the data. Um, so uh, it's interesting and then when you're able to do it, um, a lot of times uh, the solution is is the, then yet another puzzle that you have to try to solve. Um, so, we'll, and we'll talk about that if, if we have time for MLF6 um, and H2S. Once you have a film, then you like to take your film out of the chamber and do some ex situ characterization for sanity check. Is there actually a film? What does it look like? So there you use sort of all the classical um, ex situ characterization tools, so XPS, uh, Raman spectroscopy, uh, scanning electron microscopy, TEM, uh, and AFM. So these are the sort of the, the main tools that we're using. Uh, we have these systems where it looks like a TEM cross section. This is actually where we just coat uh, carbon nanotubes and, and then look at the tangent, you know, so that we can sort of do a you know, cross sections on the cheap without needing a focused ion beam. All right, and we can sort of see through that uh, edge layer and and look at our film, and that sometimes works. Uh, we have a lot of um, AFM capabilities, and uh, it's a user center that's uh, open to folks. So if there is some particular AFM capability you're interested in, please let us know. We just got our fifth Bruker AFM to do. Um, nanoscale IR, uh, AFM, we have um, AFM in a glove box to do all the electrical modes of characterization, and we have a hyzotron for nano indentation. Um, so quite a bit of, of, of surface and scanning probe capabilities. Um, okay, so now I thought it, we, we could go through an example development process uh, for sodium fluoride thin films. So if there are any questions on the basics of ALD, let me know. Otherwise, I'll talk about this. But we're all familiar with lithium ion batteries, the pros and cons of those. Um, they've changed our world. Uh, and lithium has a, is a limited resource, and it's expensive. Um, whereas sodium, you might think of as uh, the oceans being filled with sodium, might offer a, an unlimited resource for sodium ion batteries. Um, with a slight, you know, weight penalty. 
but there are lots of applications where you might have um, large sodium battery installations for storing energy from solar panels for when the sun's not out and, and things like that. So they're, they're working on uh, five-day storage for, the, for those kinds of applications where you have enough capacity to store energy for five days. And sodium batteries are a potential uh, solution for that type of application. Um, there's been work on coating uh, battery electrode materials to try to improve the cyclability and the capacity of these battery systems. And this is just an example of coating some multi-walled carbon nanotubes with the vanadium oxide. And in these complicated um, cathode or, or electrode systems, coating with ALD can be very attractive. Um, and if you're working on powder electrode systems, there's been a lot of work in coating powders either um, you know, post formation of the electrode or even in powder form and doing fluidized bed or rotary drum or other types of powder coating methods uh, where you can still get all of the uniform conformal properties of ALD then applied to a powder that you then use for your electrode application. Uh, for us, we've been uh, working on sodium um, batteries in these um, transition metal oxide systems and the efforts are um, just like with lithium is trying to reduce dendrite formation and, and form a stable interface between the cathode or, or the anode and the electrolyte um, and there's been a lot of efforts on depositing films on of different types on these systems and including sodium fluoride, which has been deposited by other means. And we wanted to deposit sodium fluoride by atomic layer deposition. Uh, and Jeff Elam's group at, at Argonne had developed a process for lithium fluoride using a lithium terpetoxide. Uh, and so we then extended that process by substituting the lithium for a sodium terpetoxide. And so car the cartoon of that process is sort of illustrated here where you have your initial surf substrate. This is sort of already starting with a, pretending we have a sodium fluoride film down. We add our precursor for some time, and we form some reactions. We've got a big ligand on this sodium terpetoxide precursor, so that blocks up several sites. Um, then we, we purge the excess uh, and send in hydrogen fluoride. Hydrogen fluoride is mixed with pyridine in the bottle, but it evolves uh, pure hydrogen fluoride into the to the contain uh, to the vacuum system. So it, we we only show the hydrogen fluoride component then that reacts with these ligands uh, and produces another hydrogen uh, sodium fluoride layer, and then repeat that to grow our film. So that's sort of the cartoon, and um, then we go back and use the quartz crystal microbalance again to look at this process after we've pulsed in uh, sodium terpetoxide and HF into the system. And we did a lot of uh, effort at looking at various pulse times. You need to establish saturation. And we can see that if we, in these two curves here, you can see some interesting behavior uh, when you have a um, three second pulse of sodium terpetoxide in both cases followed by different purge lengths. So if you have a 20 second purge, you get one particular mass change, uh, and then you see it's still going down um, when that hydrogen fluoride pulse comes in and you sort of remove the remaining ligands and then stop. Um, if you just let it keep purging, right, so extend the time before this pulse comes in, right, this interval gets longer, you see this continues to grow down uh, to go down until you add in that uh, hydrogen fluoride and then it just brings it the rest of the way to the same level. So what was interesting is that despite the change in the behavior, whether the, the sodium terpetoxide sort of continued to decompose and lose ligands or whether the HF uh, promoted that um, removal of the ligands, this net mass that was deposited was the same. So that was a kind of an interesting feature of this process that you don't always see. And it means that our 
precursors decomposing on the surface, which is usually something we want to avoid, but in this case it didn't have an impact on the film thickness. And we were still able to, um, for short, short pulse purge times, we had enough precursor st stability that we were able to saturate. Uh, but if we did go to these longer purge times, then you can just sort of continually add sodium to the system. Sorry, so this is the condition that you're trying to avoid in ALD so that you get well-defined film thicknesses. Um, so in the end, you know, we sort of settle on this intermediate purge time um, and then try to look at um, how many ligands are removed, you know, for the first and second half cycle for our film by solving uh, the surface chemistry. So writing down our equations and then adding in solving for our mass changes. Um, and so we, we can do that for both of these processes for the shorter 20 second purge and for the longer uh, six, 60 second purge. The thicknesses were the same for, uh, for each. Our growth per cycle was the same. So that was, that was pretty interesting. Our XPS results for those two types of films were the same. So we, we have sodium and fluorine. Um, in the XPS, you we see a little bit of titanium and some other things that resulted from prior runs that had been done in the reactor. But nominally, we have very um, pure sodium fluoride films with very little, we believe, very little carbon or oxygen contamination. Um, we were able to do some glancing incidence XRD uh, experiments to look at the crystal structure to s confirm we have this rock salt uh, crystal structure for sodium fluoride. That was nice to see and um, nice to get some beamline work on the second day of the beam being on. So that was, uh, we were very grateful for that. Um, if we look at the growth rate or the growth per cycle, sorry. We're just under an angstrom per cycle at 200 C. It goes up slightly at higher temperatures. Um, and this, these were measured with ellipsometry for these different growth conditions. So we do have a little bit of spread here um, where we change our purge times and pulse times. Uh, in terms of atomic force microscopy, we can look at the surface morphology and see some of these crystallites that form uh, and maybe we get a little bit more porosity uh, than we would like for the 250 C uh, temperatures and a little bit rougher film than if we had at 175 or 200. Uh, sorry, those aren't labeled. Uh, and then this was published recently um, in Journal of Vacuum Science and Technology A. Uh, and we were excited to see that they selected it as an editor's pick. And actually, we might be uh, able to provide the cover art for the special issue on ALD uh, for this work. So we're excited excited about that. Um, how am I doing on time? Because it, it's coming t toward the end. So we only have uh, three minutes or so left um, if we want to leave some time for questions. OK. We'll maybe do five minutes. Yeah, if we wanted to stop now, I could. Um, the next thing I was going to. Or we could summarize some of the work um, for sodium fluoride. You know, we're just under an angstrom per cycle, uh, and for about eight and a half to ten nanometer thick films, we're about a 1.6 nanometer surface roughness at 200 C, which is sort of the, the sweet spot. Um, it may be a little bit high for trying to deposit these films on some of the laminates due to the binders involved in in some of the cathode materials, but. Um, we can we're trying to push that down to 175 and then there were some recent work published on hf alternatives uh, using ammonium fluoride and then we may try to to use that as a fluorine source instead of the hf um, it's pretty interesting but uh, that's the end of the sodium fluoride it hopefully illustrates using those in situ capabilities um, towards understanding what's happening in the ALD process and trying to get some insight into those elementary surface reactions. The other part of my talk was about molybdenum sulfide. Um, so maybe you're familiar with molybdenum disulfide. It's a, it's a two-dimensional material. 
has some different crystal phases similar to graphene it offers a lot of opportunity for materials sort of at the ultimate level of scaling so if you're um, able to make a semiconductor that's three atoms thick that's pretty exciting if you can then make contacts to it and, and dope it appropriately and those are sort of the big research challenges but there's a tremendous number of 2d materials that are being investigated not just the the calcogenides but uh we're sort of got our blinders on uh, relative to molybdenum disulfide. There's been a ton of work in exfoliated films and studying their properties uh, and, and finding these uh, direct to indirect band gap transitions um, and that depend on the number of layers you have. So if you have a, a monolayer, you get a direct band gap. If you're above five layers, it's an indirect band gap. Um, regardless, the band gap's larger than silicon, so if you were using MOS2 in devices, bulk or, or monolayer form, you would have a larger band gap and potentially could make lower leakage devices. Um, but there's a lot of interest in the direct band gap nature as well, and the, and the electronic band gap's even larger than the sort of the optical band gap that people normally talk about. But the, um, there's different polymorphs, and you can use the 1T phase to make contacts to the 2H phase so that there's some interesting ways to couple electrodes into these systems. We have been trying to grow it at low temperature in a crystalline form and um, you can grow very high quality molybdenum disulfide with chemical vapor deposition uh, but it's very hard to do that at temperatures that are what's called back end of line compatible. So when the semiconductor industry wants to deposit the MOS2, they've already built a whole bunch of materials on the device, a whole bunch of structures, so they can't really heat it above maybe 500 degrees C for very long, or because you're going to just start to change dopant profiles and um, have materials diffuse into one and another. And so there's a, a, a need for a lower temperature process. So we can grow MOS2 at low temperatures, it just is amorphous. So we're trying to grow at a crystalline form at low temperatures. And to do that, we're trying to dig into all of the, learn everything we can about the basics of the synthesis process for MOS2. And that's sort of um, what I've got here. So this is um, some of our early work on establishing our chemical reactions for bulk growth. Um, you've seen some of these curves before. We can, we can see that it's amorphous as deposited. After annealing, we get some um, crystal structure to form and we can anneal as low as 350 C if we go up to 900 you know we get sort of better um, crystal structures as you know as a result better, better crystallinity larger grains it's still uh, tricky to understand exactly what's happened so we have a paper um, that was published in 2018 and the um, just on the basics of the process that's growing MOS2 on itself but the, the main challenge that we're facing now is trying to understand what happens. So that's all sort of nice, and, and we think we nominally understand what's happening. But what the, our main challenge is trying to understand what happens during nucleation. Because we're pollinating us to, say, on aluminum oxide uh, that was grown by ALD and might have a surface layer of hydroxyls at the end, and trying to look at that, um, that chemistry and understand what's contributing to this difference in these peak heights and this different levels here as a function of temperature. Um, you can sort of intuitively see that you have a smaller amount of hydroxyls from the FTIR than if uh, at, at 250C than at 150C. And you can see this change in the hydroxyl intensity when you add MOF6 uh, changes as a function of temperature. And so we've sort of been looking into that. Um, and I don't want to go over in time if folks have questions, but so we're still wrapping our, our minds around uh, the nucleation process. Cool. Thank, thank you, Eldon. Um, we have a, a couple minutes here. I can take one or two questions before uh, noon. I, I'm going to have to stop at noon. I'm, I'll transfer host over to you, Eldon, in case other people have questions. I have a student's talk I need to attend. Yeah, absolutely, and I'm uh, happy to, to stick around. Um, I think I had another one-on-one -on -one session at uh, one. Right. So, Heather, if you wanted to, I guess I can stop the recording here.